Recently, a service that I use called Plex was hacked. And as I was reading through this disclosure email that was explaining some of the information that had been leaked and what the next steps that I should do to make sure that my account and other accounts were gonna stay secure, it got me thinking, am I doing enough to protect myself from hacks? The answer is, well, maybe not, but it led me down this rabbit hole about an idea called attack surface. Now, attack surface is usually not a concept that we really use when we think about someone's personal security. It's more so something that we think of when we think about IT or a company or larger infrastructure uh, and networks that need to make sure that their network is secure. But I think it's a concept that we can use for our personal digital security and privacy as well. Um, so what exactly is attack surface? What am I talking about here? And I have a little metaphor to explain um, what attack surface is. So think about having a city or a town and you want to try and prevent people from getting into this town, right? So this town has all this information about you. It has, you know, valuable things. You want to try and keep people out. So you might put up walls around your town in order to try and stop people from getting in, right? So that if you go back to the digital world, that might be things like encryption or two-factor authentication um, that are going to try and stop the people that you don't want to come in and look at all of your information or take your things um, to keep them out. But of course, there are going to be ways to get through those walls. So an attacker might come along with a ladder and try to climb up and jump over the wall and bam, they've gotten inside your city. Now, the idea with attack surface is actually reducing the size of that city, right? Because the smaller the city is, the smaller the, the boundary of the wall that it has to cover, the less likely it is that someone's going to be successful coming along and climbing over the top with a ladder. But if you have an enormous city with enormous walls, well, okay, you might be able to stop most of the people who are coming along with a ladder and trying to climb over the top, but eventually it's more likely that somebody's going to be able to get through. So that's the idea of attack surface, trying to reduce down um, the surface area that people can actually attack. And in a digital context, you know, this means trying to minimize the chance that you might be um, the victim of a hack, that you might be affected by data getting leaked, um, things like that, or just overall a breach of some kind. So how do you actually go about reducing your attack surface? Well, there are a few things that you can do. The first thing that I think is really important is trying to reduce trust. So, you know, all of the different services that you use, you need to trust that they're not going to have a leak or a breach of some kind, which would then expose your data in some way. Obviously, you don't really have control over whether they have a breach, but you can control the amount of services that you're trusting or who you decide to trust as well. Obviously, some companies, some uh, systems are going to be more trustworthy than others, and you want to try and go for the ones you know that you back not to just sell your data or have really shoddy security and end up leaking your data, or maybe even give you some level of control over your data yourself. And that's where you can get to um, trustless systems as well, or decentralized systems often thought of in this way. Basically the idea, and this is an idea that we've implemented with Session, is instead of just having one company or one person or one anything that's operating the entire network that you need to trust basically not to mess up, you distribute that responsibility. And that way, no one person, no one server um, has perfect information about anybody. And so you don't need to trust that they're not going to leak your data because, well, there's not really any data particularly to leak. So it removes that element of trust. So where you can, using trustless systems over trusted ones is also a really good idea. The other thing that you should really think about doing is trying to reduce the burden on yourself. You don't want to have to go and dive into privacy settings or check storage settings to try and figure out, okay, well, is my data safe? Instead, it's a good idea to try and use um, services or apps um, or devices that have privacy positive policies to begin with, that are looking to try and protect you as well, basically batting for the same team as you, as opposed to somebody who's maybe trying to work against you or exploit your data for their own benefit. Another important thing that you can do is try to eliminate vulnerabilities. I know that a lot of you have probably already stopped using Facebook potentially years ago, maybe even completely cut Meta out altogether and gone in and deleted your accounts or just stopped using them. But the thing is, you know, is Meta still holding on to some of that personal information about you? Could it still be stored? And if there was a leak, would you be exposed? And you can take this idea and apply it to really any company or service that you use. If you've signed up for something, used it for a little bit, maybe decided that you don't really get that much use out of it, stopped using it, 
maybe even deactivated your account, but did you actually go and request that that data was deleted in any way and make sure that your personal data was no longer stored on those services? And if you can't do that, it's still a good idea to keep track of where, you know, which companies might actually have some personal information about you so that, you know, if you do see an article that pops up and says XYZ company has just had a data leak or a breach, you at least have some level of awareness about whether you're going to be affected by that. The other thing that you should really do is try to add barriers. Make it so that if there's some kind of compromise, some kind of leak, some kind of hack, that you can compartmentalize what is actually affected. So one really effective way to do this is by using two-factor authentication. You know, this way, potentially, if one of your passwords is leaked, you still have the ability to deny an attacker getting access to one of your services. Another thing that's obviously really important is using password managers. Gone are the days of being able to use one password or even a handful of passwords for all of your accounts. You really don't want to be doing that. Use a password manager, have a different password for every account. That way, if one of them gets leaked, at least only one account is going to be affected. You only have to change one password, potentially. And if you have 2FA, maybe that account won't even be compromised at all. And the last thing that you can do is, called, is, is just staying up to date. And there's really two aspects when I say staying up to date. The first thing uh, is staying up to date with software, making sure that the software that you're using is the most up to date version. All the time there are going to be bugs that are found or potentially um, some kind of security weakness that is found. It'll be patched, repaired, fixed um, and you know the new version will be or will have extra protections or mitigations against that. You know, security is really a cat and mouse game. There's constantly uh, something that was maybe secure 10 years ago might not be secure now. Um, even though you know it might have been well built at the time, eventually a vulnerability was found. Uh, and so that's why it's really important to make sure that you are staying up to date. And on the other side of things, there's staying up to date in terms of staying up to date with information. So like I was saying, it's a cat and mouse game. It's important to stay up to date with what kinds of attacks are going around, what kinds of things can you use to try and mitigate an attack or uh, reduce your attack surface. You know, things like 2FA uh, and password managers weren't necessarily widely utilized applications 5, 10, 15 years ago. Potentially, you know, really niche applications that are now considered must-haves, absolute essentials for digital security. And over the next 5, 10, 15 years, no doubt in my mind, there is going to be a bunch of new tools that come up that become really commonplace to use and you should be trying to stay up to date with what some of those things are so that you can stay ahead of the game. And as well, on the, on the flip side of things, and this might be a little bit more complex, but you can also pay attention to what kinds of attacks are really common, um, maybe even what kinds of attacks are really common against people like you. You know, if you're potentially, um, you know, a person that would be more likely to be uh, targeted by some kind of malicious hack. Um, that way you can, once again, take the steps required to make it harder for those kinds of attack vectors to actually affect you. So those really are the five tips that we've got um, for you today to try and reduce that attack surface. It's a really interesting thing to think about um, and you never know, maybe one day it'll really help you out and save you from a bad situation. Um, so let us know if those tips were helpful and until next time.